Thank you so much um, for being here today. We are about to kick off our AI career panel. Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm Jacqueline Kung. I'm the um, career counselor for the Master's of Computer Science program. Um, I know this event is actually open to all of ICS so that you guys can learn more um, about MCS as well as other professional oriented programs. But um, we are really excited to actually be facilitating and hosting this panel with our partner Technosys today um, to give you guys you know, more knowledge about what you guys can be doing as you guys are preparing for your careers um, in tech and also thinking about how to future-proof and design a career path accordingly. Um, as we all know, um, technology is always evolving. So my goal and our goal is to really help educate you guys to make sure you guys are well prepped and um, kind of know what to expect before you guys enter the workforce to find ideas and learn from these um, great individuals who will probably be great mentors as well um, to really help understand how to stay relevant in an industry, uh, what trends to look for, and what you guys can do from a professional growth standpoint so that you guys will always be keeping up and you guys can also develop um, as you guys are our next generation of leaders in the workforce. So um, without me saying any more, I did want to make an introduction of our moderator today. Um, and that will be, I have, do you have my thing? Oh no, I have it, we're good. So we can all actually uh, welcome Elijah Young. He is the business development executive for Technosis. He, he's been um, really helpful in helping me organize this um, panel today. But Elijah is a highly relational speaker in emerging tech um, is executive who helps mid to large enterprises navigate the complexities of the modern technology landscape. He has 18 years of B2B experience and he serves as a liaison between tech teams and the business. Elijah helps close the gap between solutions and the business outcomes to move clients from science projects to scalable ROI. So if we can just welcome Elijah and he will introduce you. Hi everyone, how are we doing? Yeah, thank you guys for being here, taking time out of your days. Uh, we definitely appreciate this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce our panel, and we have a hot and heavy uh, hour. And what I mean by that is there's a ton of questions that we both facilitated from you uh, and that we kind of uh, put together as well. And our hope is that we answer you know, any and every question that, you, that we can within an hour, and then after the hour we'll have a little bit of time to network, right, and, and, and meet some folks if you haven't had a chance. Uh, to meet the panel today. Um, most everybody here today are practitioners, um, and so you'll be able to hear directly from the field and answer the, during the Q&A time, uh, answer or ask any questions uh, that you have related to how can I, you know, graduating with my master's uh, in, in computer science, how, how can I apply AI technology? How can I apply uh, machine learning? What do companies look for? What types of teams and projects are, are being built right now, right? And so uh, we think that's going to be very, very compelling for you guys to learn this information. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists. So um, as I call your name, please come up. So Anmol, um, if you can come up with us, he is the Customer Success Manager at UiPath. And you can take your seat there. Uh, Anmol comes with a strong analytical background with a degree of math and computer science from Washington University in St. Louis. He has always been inspired by his alma mater's mission to inspire each person known by name and story to lead lives of purpose and meaning. From there, he began an early stage employee at UiPath, joining as an RPA developer and the 12th US-based employee. With the accelerating growth of the market, he grew to the role of technical lead for the Americas, where he got a broader view of the challenges and problems customers faced. With this context, he moved to a customer success role, helping key customers develop comprehensive strategies to deploy automation within their enterprises and move to Orange County to help launch the UiPath Southwest, Southwest office in Irvine. Animal continues to explore the ability for automation to take the robot out of the human. We'll talk about that. So, <laughs> so that everyone can focus uh, their time and their efforts on the most creative, challenging, and human work. Would you help me in welcoming Animal? Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Ray Fang, if you can come up as well and take your seat. He's a principal research scientist at DMAI. Dr. Uh, Ray is the research and development director at DMAI. Prior to this, he was a research scientist at Thomson Reuters AI Lab and worked on several AI projects in news, finance, and law. 
Dr. Fang received his Ph.D. in computer science from the Language and Interaction Research Group at Michigan State University in 2014. His research focuses on context-aware language use and develops computational approaches for situated language processing to facilitate multimodal dialogue with artificial agents. He has published more than 30 papers in peer-reviewed conferences and journals. He also constantly serves as a program committee member for top AI conferences such as IJ, IJCAI, ACL, and AAAI, which is AAAI, <laughs> <laughs> and et cetera, right? Would you help me in welcoming Dr. Rick? <laughs> Next panelist is uh, David, am I pronouncing it? Kai? Kai. Kai, got it. Okay, he's a senior quantitative analyst at Strategic, uh, at strategic Global Advisors. David is a senior um, quantitative analyst at Strategic Global Advisors, an institutional asset management firm, where he uses a combination of quantitative modeling, <coughs> data analysis, and investment expertise to identify attractive investment opportunities in the global stock market. He specializes in applying machine learning algorithms on both structured and unstructured data to extract useful information. David earned his BBA in finance and mathematics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Master of Financial Engineering from University of California, Berkeley. Would you help me in welcoming David? <laughs> Next up is Isaac uh, Bozeman. If you can um, come on down and take your seats well. He is the architect and AI practice lead at Technosis. Isaac is a speaker, author, and researcher in machine learning, deep learning, and AI. Isaac is uh, currently the practice uh, lead at Technosis and has delivered many AI projects in computer vision, natural language processing, and expert systems. With 15 years of experience and a master's of science degree from software in, in software engineering from the University of Liverpool, he teaches developers how to achieve machine learning greatness using tutorials, videos, courses, and a podcast that you can find at machineislearning.com. Welcome, Isaac. <laughs> Last and certainly not least uh, is Kelsey uh, Tiptek. You can come on down. She is the human resources lead at uh, BlackBerry Silence. Kelsey has a strong HR background with a degree in business administration with the emphasis in management and human resources. Her passion for helping BlackBerry Silence build their future generation of innovators is one of the main reasons she manages and champions the BlackBerry Silence internship flag program. To support recruitment efforts, Kelsey builds and manages university relationships and plans engaging events for the organization's talent communities. Kelsey continues to be one of BlackBerry Silence's biggest brand ambassadors, taking delight and sharing the importance of BlackBerry Silence's mission and why it is an exciting time to join the team. Silence is a software firm that is revolutionizing cybersecurity with AI-based solutions that predict and prevent execution and advanced threats and malware at the endpoint. Would you welcome Kelsey? <laughs> All right, that's your, that is your panel for today. So we're going to jump into some of the questions that we've curated from you and some questions that we have that we think will be uh, applicable to today's session. And uh, we're going to jump in. So the way we're going to do this, guys, is, is popcorn style. So there are a ton of questions that we're going to be asking you guys. And <laughs> starting with some musical chairs uh, first. <laughs> uh, the idea in, in popcorn style, of course, is... We want to give you guys a chance to share um, answers that you feel passionate about. And so we might take, you know, if, if it feels good, we might take um, a couple more minutes on a specific topic if it feels like there's good energy in the room. If not, we'll, we'll move to the next set of questions. All right? So here's where we're going to start. Uh, this is broken down into early career, career growth, and industry trends and overall business, okay? So we're going to start with the first, the big umbrella of AI, and kind of talk about the subsets uh, therein. So AI is a broad and varied umbrella. What are some of the main problems AI is tackling, and can you guys share some of them? So anyone from, from the panel, if you want to just jump in, what are some of the, genu the, the problems that AI is just solving in general? Who wants to start? <laughs> sure, I'll start. So, <laughs> um, it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty broad question, but obviously there's industries where AI is really shown to, to, you know, to make a difference. I think um, I was actually talking to David about uh, one of the applications called Plant MD. Has anyone heard of Plant MD? 
So there's a, this application that was developed in, um, by two high school students. And essentially, it's a computer vision based solution that takes pictures of plants and it can detect the diseases on plants. And, uh, you know, for most people, you go, well, it's just a plant. But this specific plant, like, feeds half a billion people every day. And so this application is just kind of like one of the areas of computer vision where AI is really kind of making a difference. And, you know, there's, there's I think, you know, generally computer vision seem to be the, the trendiest solutions. Like, I know seeing AI by Microsoft, it helps you to kind of the blind to see better. It's like this audible kind of device in the glasses. Uh, I think, um, you know, obviously there's some, you know, automation that's improving AI. There's healthcare that's improving it. So I think there's a lot of different industries that AI has really impacted, but it's also going to, I think. Um, I don't know if that answers the question fully, but... You know. It does, yeah. It, it definitely does. Anybody else want to tackle that? Thanks for that, Isaac. Yes. Um, I, I just want to add, I mean, there are so many applications of the AI, and it, is, it, it, it might sound very sophisticated and complex, but really it is just in you some input data, and then you have some output really connect the dots. So we talk about computer vision, but you can still use a lot of uh, computer um, artificial intelligence, um, different type of data, and uh, extract information out of it. So you're talking about image data that's using computer vision. Then you have uh, textual data. You have audio data. Imagine you talk to a robot. The robot just understands exactly what you're talking about. That that's Alexa, Siri. So there's you know massive application with AI, but it's really identify the problem you're trying to solve, identify whether you have the data to solve that problem. Yeah, and I'd, like, I'd like to add to that as well. So one of the most exciting things um, about working at Silence, and I'm, I'm not a, a technical person, but I get to see AI in action every single day. And we utilize artificial intelligence in our, our products to prevent cyber attacks and um, you know, no matter who you are, whether you're technical or not, everyone can relate to that. And so um, that's what the best part to me about working at BlackBerry Science. We're really we're solving this real problem utilizing artificial intelligence. Awesome. But, yeah, where you want to take it? Yeah. <coughs> so uh, just take our uh, company, BMA as an uh, example. So we actually uh, develop a, a cognitive AI uh, platform that uh, unify uh, all the AI uh, 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 technologies like computer vision, uh, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, and robotics to uh, uh, unify uh, AI prop, uh, platform. Uh, we not only solve the like a uh, perception problem, like what you can hear, what you can see, but also cognitive problem, like what's your intent, what's your uh, what's uh, in your mind. Uh, how should I uh, talk to you? Like, what's your uh, preference? What's your in interest? So we are solving. Uh, I think AI will solve uh, perception uh, problems and uh, cognitive cognitive problems. And right now, uh, I think the deep learning will be better at solving uh, perception problems uh, with big data. But uh, with uh, uh, cognitive problem, uh, big data is not enough. We need to understand uh, those uh, mind. Uh, prevalence interest, and then based on that, uh, those top-down uh, signal we understand uh, like uh, people well and provide service accordingly. So that's uh, what we do uh, in our startup company. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I and I will call an animal just really quick because I I want you to tackle that question from, you know, you said to take the robot out of the human, yeah. and and how would you apply kind of this thought towards, you know. What are all the broad areas that AI is kind of tackling in terms of how you're doing that? How are we taking the robot out of the human? Absolutely. So one of the big things about AI when we look at it is AI is usually not an end-to-end -end solution to a problem. It's just a point-in-time solution to a specific part of a problem. So to peel back a little bit, uh, UiPath is a company that does robotic process automation, RPA, which is taking something that you do on your computer over and over again, and instead of you having to do it, uh, we're a software platform that allows you to build automations to do the same thing. So, for example, let's say you're registering for classes. You know that to register for your classes, you're going to have to do a lot of the same steps of logging into your student portal, uh, deciding what your schedule is going to look like, and then actually registering for the classes. Uh, oftentimes with RPA, you have the opportunity to automate a lot of those steps, 
but you still have to make the judgment call on which classes you want to register for, which classes are going to be relevant to where you want to go with your career. So that's where we can start bringing AI in even and using the cognitive abilities of some trained models to make those decisions for you and also allow you know the robotic tasks of logging into your uh, career portal or anything like that happen automatically. So AI can be a little bit of a conduit to apply your human intelligence and you have other technologies available to you to do the non-intelligent, manual, repetitive, and rules-based things that uh, you have to do anyway. Awesome. That's a, that's a great jumping off to this next question, you guys. And, and what, what it's going to be is, how is your organization using AI uh, to move your business or your organization forward? So I've, I've kind of heard a piece from some of you, but let's just scale that up a little bit more and talk about that a little bit deeper. So I got yours, Animal, um, but for the other panelists, how is your organization using AI to move the business forward? Whoever wants to take it, jump in, or I'll call on you. <laughs> sure, I'll kick us off. Okay. So, um, at BlackBerry Silence, so not only are we utilizing artificial intelligence um, in our uh, to build out mathematical models and prevent cyber t cyber attacks, and um, but we also are seeing as a business that we're utilizing more AI technology. Um, so, on my side of the house, on the recruiting side, and on HR, we're seeing more and more tools come out that are utilizing AI. So for example, we're looking into um, you know, AI video interviewing platforms or um, even looking into uh, the preliminary screenings going through an AI tool as well. So what we're seeing, not only are we in the industry utilizing artificial intelligence um, in our products, um, to solve a problem, but we're actually utilizing more tools um, to solve area solve problems in other areas of the business as well. Awesome, thank you for that. Next one, take that. Um, so for me, I work at an asset management firm, Strategic Global Advisors. Uh, we buy stocks. We like to buy stocks that's likely to go up, and we don't like stocks that that's going that, that's going to go down. So traditionally, uh, we have run quantitative models on on each stock. What I mean is that we have expectation of each stock's return. And uh, historically, that has been a linear model. But if you look at why the stock price will go up or go down, it can be a little bit more complex than a linear combination of a bunch of uh, things. So slowly, we kind of, we, we kind of especially today with the better, uh, with the better uh, computers as well as better libraries, we kind of moved away from linear model to some of the nonlinear model to try to capture the complex relationship because whether a stock goes up or down is really determined by people. What's the supply and demand? Who's willing to buy? Who's willing to sell? There's a lot of reasons that go into it. I can tell you we have not been very successful at doing that by <laughs> <laughs> machine learning. The, the truth is that you really have to look at the problem you're trying to solve. You just can't say we're going to use machine learning to do everything. The stocks itself what we call non-stationary, which means the mean and the standard deviation change across time. You can't classify a cat because the look of the cat doesn't really change. But human behavior change over time. And the human behavior buying stocks or selling will also change. And you don't have a lot of history, in, at least in my business, because we only have roughly 50 to 100 years of stock price and return. So you end up really try to fit that history really, really well, and then out of sample, you don't really do well. So you have to look at a different problem you're trying to solve. So the AI or machine learning algorithms are pretty good today, but it's more of a finding the problem. So then you kind of look at a different type of problem. If I can't predict stock return, then what can I predict? I can predict my own behavior. Why buy a stock? Why sell a stock? I can look at I don't, while I'm buying or selling, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm using machine learning to model my own behavior. I think that's something a lot, not a lot of people are doing because it's not an end-to-end -end solution. It's not 100, 200 features lead to Apple is going to go up 10%, down 5% tomorrow. It's more of, there's a lot of things that determine my own behavior. And I can see whether I end up buying or, or selling Apple. So I think the point is not just blindly apply 
whatever neural network you want to because they sound fancy and then you want to show you know it. It's really identify the problem you want to solve. And then select the best algorithm to do that. Awesome. That's very insightful. Um, Quick question. We're going to do Q&A at the end. Can you take your question down and write it? That'd be, that'd be awesome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, well, um, anybody else want to answer that before I jump on to the next? Okay. Awesome. Um, great, great segue into this next question. So that, that being said, what advice would you give uh, panel to you know, UCI students that are you know, graduating soon or some point in time with a computer science or an MCS degree? What, what advice would you give them um, as they're looking forward to future-proofing their career? Right, That's why they're here. Um, maybe they haven't learned the AI stack. Maybe they you know, have learned pieces of TensorFlow or PyTorch or they've touched some ML models or they've been in you know, collabs on Google or whatever, but they haven't necessarily done a lot of projects yet. So what advice would you give them um, as they're graduating or, or looking to form careers around upcoming technologies? Maybe Ray, will take that? <laughs> and can you guys hear okay from the panel? Just make sure? Okay, because uh, if not, we can pass the mic. Yeah, so for the past two years, I was interviewing uh, more than, I think, 300 uh, of uh, candidates. So what I'm uh, looking for it's like the person who can actually uh, have basic uh, problem solving skills and programming skills and some mathematics uh, background. And uh, they are willing to learn more uh, new things uh, in a fast pay, uh, pace uh, environment. So that's uh, what I'm look, uh, looking for for the past two years. So uh, uh, in terms of technology, I think uh, some basic uh, machine learning uh, algorithm and uh, let's say NLP uh, algorithm. The, uh, if you are working, you, you have work on some particular pro uh, project, and in your school, which is related to AI or using AI to reformulate your problem, and you can uh, show that kind of capability solving uh, cap uh, problem in some particular project, and you can talk to us uh, in. Uh, 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 free way, or you can uh, show that uh, even though you don't have that uh, in-depth knowledge, but uh, uh, through uh, discussion, uh, you can show that uh, you can actually uh, catch up uh, with uh, available uh, knowledge or uh, learning. So uh, that's something uh, what I'm uh, looking for. That's awesome. So what I hear you saying is that you're looking for the ability to solve problems, not necessarily show me every problem you've solved, right? The, the, the ability to drive new thinking. And I, that almost ties into how SGA looks at the problem. Instead of looking at the problem head on, we're looking at all the behaviors around the problem to give us input to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing that what I'm hearing from you, Ray, is, is that you're looking for, for the thinking process, if you will, more than just the solve. Anybody else want to take that? I can jump in with uh, two pieces, actually. So first, uh, echoing a little bit of what David was saying, I think it's really important whenever you're in uh, any sort of business situation to be able to clearly define the problem that you actually want to solve. Oftentimes, when you have a toolkit, especially a fun toolkit like AI at your disposal, the first thing you're going to want to do is just start applying whatever cool new machine learning model you learned about uh, to the problem. But really, there's a lot more value in being able to take a step back and uh, deciding whether it's a problem that will even need AI in the first place, or if it's just a problem that can be solved with some, let's call them more traditional methods. Uh, so being able to define that very clearly will save you a lot of frustration, banging your head against the wall, and just help you find the right answers. And the second one is uh, just quite simply, you have to be bold. Uh, one of the big things, especially in an emerging field like AI, is that no one actually has any idea what they're doing. <laughs> and so uh, there's a great Richard Branson quote about it. Of, you know, if someone gives you an opportunity and you don't know how to do it, say yes and figure out how to do it later. So just have the trust that you guys are all in this room because you're all in incredibly intelligent. Just trust in yourselves that if you have an opportunity to do something, whether it be with AI, whether it be with any sort of emerging field, take the opportunity and figure out how to actually do it later. Good, good advice. Jump in. I'd love to add to that. So. Um, absolutely, I completely agree. And there, what we really like to see when we're doing the recruiting process um, from students, especially, is one, 
if you can get an internship, get an internship. I'm sure you hear that from your advisors, your professors, all of that all the time, um, but it really helps. The other thing too through the recruiting process is we love to hear from students that are working on projects outside of their schoolwork. Schoolwork is great and it definitely counts, especially when you can communicate clearly exactly what you did and really walk through that process. But if you're just doing, um, you know, building out a project on the side just for fun or because you were interested in it, um, we love that. If you're reading blogs and just staying up with industry news, tell your, you know, when you're interviewing, make sure to tell the recruiter, make sure to tell the hiring team. Um, when we hire for interns and we have our calls with our, uh, with our hiring managers and say, who are you looking for? I'm looking for someone who's curious, resourceful, who really wants to be in this industry. Um, so it, a lot of times it has nothing to do specifically with like, I need them to be really advanced in Python or anything like that. They're, those are major pluses, but it's more of that curiosity. Um, my other suggestion too is find meetup groups. Um, use all the, the free resources online. My, my other favorite question to ask students when we're interviewing is when you get, um, when you get asked to do something and you get stuck, what's your next move? And I'm really looking for someone that um, really wants to be a problem solver and will go research online. Um, you know, it's funny, but it's like the best answer is like, oh, I'd Google it or I would check an open source <laughs> library or, you know, th those are, uh, it really shows that you're invested. And um, like it was mentioned before, AI is such an emerging field, so you're really getting in at the ground floor. So there's a lot of opportunity um, to really grow and learn um, by getting that internship experience and going to meetups and, and interacting with other people in the field. That's good. Yeah, and I think that's kind of in alignment with how, how do you think, right? How do you process a problem? And when you get stuck, how do you take that problem to the next level? So uh, very good. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but one of Albert Einstein's favorite ways to answer a question was, I don't know. And I think for, for those uh, of us that work in this field, we have to be the one with the answer, right? And so I want you to just think about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and saying, I don't know, right? Because that doesn't mean you can't go figure it out, right? I think some of these companies and leaders are looking for teams and building teams that have the acumen to think through a problem critically and decide on some best practice around how to address the problem, not necessarily just tackling the problem head on. So I think you're, you're mentioning that again, that's great. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit just to move, continue moving the conversation along. So what, what's the difference you know, between AI research, because there's a lot in AI research, right? And there's AI development, right? You guys are, many of you here in the audience either have just received, uh, if you're in the last cohort, your, your certificate in this program, or you're, you're working on that now. So um, if you haven't spent any time in AI, are you thinking like, hey, I might want to forge my career in AI development, or maybe I want to forge my career in AI research? So let's have the panel kind of, what, what's the difference from your, your view panel on AI research or AI development? <laughs> so uh, uh, as an uh, uh, IND uh, director, so I would say like uh, we uh, did not uh, divide uh, these two roles uh, very clearly in our company. So we have, uh, like right now have uh, 60 uh, IND uh, team. So uh, research team, uh, if we have to put, like research team is more like we uh, experiment and check the algorithms or the approach from the paper and we implement it and check the performance, whether how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, CPU uh, uh, cost, what's the, uh, what's the uh, complexity of the time, uh, what, uh, uh, how fast it uh, uh, can run. So those real-time factor and the efficiency and the memory use, uh, if, uh, if that pass, then we need to implement it in our product, whether this uh, product uh, need this uh, algorithm or approach. So that's more like a development part. We put, uh, we uh, research the approach uh, in the uh, in the world. We pick up uh, one that is mo most suitable for our product. So that's uh, like uh, uh, these two roles. Like uh, sometimes it's uh, one person play these two roles. Uh, so we did not divide into two separate sure. persons. So that's uh, what happened uh, uh, in uh, our company. But uh, 
but for like uh, if we want to divide it into more broad uh, uh, case, like for students, uh, like PhD students, uh, when I was a PhD student, I mainly focusing on getting a new approach for maybe a new uh, problem or an old problem and get it published and then I graduate. That's a more like a research. Mm. Uh, uh, right now, uh, when I was in, I think uh, in 2014, uh, after I graduated, uh, I went to uh, quantum lectures in New York, uh, and I left. So we, we faced a problem that uh, journalists, they face uh, a lot of uh, events. Some are uh, rumors, some are you know, really valuable. So how to quickly identify those two uh, events, news events, and uh, debunk all those uh, rumors. So that's the uh, big, biggest problem for them. Uh, and it need to be uh, do it need to be done in a uh, million seconds, so so it requires you know uh, uh, accuracy and uh, speed in uh, in the product. So we actually uh, we do we just use all those you know old uh, techniques, not uh, deep learning, not uh, you know fast in AI uh, algorithms. We just uh, pick out the problem and uh, pick out the uh, approach for that uh, problem. So that's uh, more like a uh, 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 IND uh, uh, role, but not not, not pure uh, purely uh, research. And at the same time, we actually develop, uh, we modify the algorithm, and it actually uh, work better in some benchmark result. Then we publish it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like a, it's like a byproduct. Mm -hmm. uh, research uh, paper is our you know uh, byproduct. Wow. So we are developing uh, products for uh, journalists. So that's uh, awesome. yeah, that's some uh, differences. Yeah, I, I hear you say before I pass to the next panel. What I hear you saying is you, you've developed and deployed, you know, kind of a, a, a research acumen, and then you have kind of a development framework that is iterative based on how how the problem is being solved in real time, right? And then if, so, if you hit upon something that seems like it's a win, then there's a research paper that gets flagged. And, and built around that. Is that accurate? That's awesome. Anybody else want to tackle that? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I think I think the biggest difference between academia and kind of more business side is there's different constraints. You know, when you're doing research, you don't have a constraint that says this has to be, you know, in the, the real kind of business setting in the next hundred years. Where if you're working for a business and you're saying, I've got this really great idea and it's probably going to take a hundred years to develop. They're not going to be so eager to fund that, right? So, so I think when you're actually in a project, there's a certain budget, there's a certain roadmap, and you have to really make work with that. So I think there are companies like Qualcomm, there's a few, you know, kind of Thomson Reuters, they've got labs that's a little bit more research focused, but generally your constraint is still, we want to try and find efficiencies, we want to improve certain research aspects within the next few years, two or three years, where if you're purely in an academic setting, there's really no constraints. And I think the other difference is with academia is that your peer review, the setting, it's a lot more rigorous in terms of proving your results, getting your results reviewed versus where you're in, in business. It's, it's more of let's find the results. Let's get a product out that's actually working and we'll iterate and we'll figure it out as it goes. And I think there are just two different ways of kind of, you know, sort of dealing with the constraints. Got it. Good. Good, good. Anybody else on this side want to speak on that? Anybody else? All right, good. Uh, let's go to the next question. So how is AI threatening to challenge or transform the overall technology landscape? How is AI threatening or challenging the overall lands technology landscape, from your view? Anybody want to take that? I'll give a non-traditional answer to this one. Uh, so I, if you guys are around a lot of enterprises recently, you'll start hearing uh, something that they throw around that oil used to be the most uh, valuable commodity in the world. Now it's data. Yeah. And uh, especially with AI, what that means is uh, with the applications that are currently being uh, developed and deployed. Right now, uh, in the past, it was all applications that were very, very functional. Now those applications often have to be able to build their own data and provide data into a data lake that can later be consumed by ML models or anything like that to actually start applying some intelligence and process improvement on top of it. So right now, uh, the technology is fundamentally going to shift from being something that's very functional and just uh, answering a specific business or personal need to being something that can help us be predictive going forward and make processes and programs more efficient without us even realizing. 
Good. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, well, back. I'll back up here for a quick second on the the last question that we kind of tackled. And you know, if you if you're thinking, like you know. I'm very interested in AI research. Uh, I, I like the research space. I'm not necessarily trying to have a deployable product in the market and develop that product specifically, right? Whether it's computer vision or NLP or OCR or RPA or whatever. Maybe you're not interested in, in the actual, that piece, but you're interested in, in the algorithm side, the research side, kind of the pre-problem, if you will. Um, you know, I would, I would just give you a recommendation to do a couple Kaggle challenges. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure this crew, if they were looking to hire you and they saw how you, how, you know, on your Git or whatever, and they saw how you approached a Kaggle challenge and what your contribution was to that challenge, and you won some money, maybe, you know, if you win, right? Um, but I think that would help to kind of inform employers around how you're looking at this emerging stack and how you're stepping in the conversation instead of, you know, I went to UCI, I've got, this is my degree, and this is some of the projects I worked on. I, now, I understand specifically because I've worked with uh, Jacqueline and the team here, Jason and, and uh, Dean Marios, like, I understand that this specific group in MCS is working more on um, applications, right? You're, you're trying to build something and get ready to go to the market to build something. Those of us that have not graduated here in the room, that's what you're looking to do. Uh, but as you look at AI, how are you, how are you going to inform an employer about if you're doing mostly project in your in your coursework, right? How are you going to inform inform an employer about your AI acumen, right? So my advice would be, uh, and, and I'm going to ask this to the panels: What advice would you give to the students in terms of if you were looking at a resume or you're looking at talking to an intern? What would you need to see in terms of project, in terms of Kaggle or Git or whatever, to say, "Wow, I find you very compelling." What, 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 how would you guys answer that? I would say definitely Kaggle competition, GitHub, just generally you want to show curiosity. I mean, you can't just go out and say, I have a, I have a degree, bachelor degree in CS, master degree in CS. There's, it's, a, it's a competitive market, especially if you want a top-end job. You want to go work at Google, you want to work, work, at, work at Facebook, Uber, and then do your machine learning, be a machine learning engineer. You just have to show that you're interested in. I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, Competition. Kaggle is one. There's a, a company sponsor competition. One is uh, I don't know if you've heard. Uh, Citadel have their uh, data science competition. Cash prize is 20k. They do it in different uh, regions, and of course you automatically get interviews. So that's a one way for an employer to let people do competition for them to select best talent. And generally, I, I think the skill set it, it's more of you don't have to know everything, especially, I don't know whether you're a bachelor or graduate, you don't have to know everything super, super deep, because I don't think that's expected. You don't have to worry about, you know, every syntax of TensorFlow or Python, or know, or be an expert in a single area. I think if you purely want to go into a AI research, you probably do a PhD, you're gonna, you're gonna touch that. But at this, at this stage, I think you have to have the general math. A lot of people might not have that. It's, it's, it's not, you don't have to have, I think it's just calculus, linear algebra, probability will cover most the machine learning algorithm you're gonna use. And uh, be, be good with Python, and, uh, or even R, and do a lot of projects. The more you do, the better. People, I, I don't, in my opinion, it's, this, is, this is not what you call, a, I, I think this is called more, a little bit more social science. It's not, one plus one equals to two. It's a problem that takes iterations to solve. The more you do, the more experience you're gonna gain. Nobody knows, if we're, let's say we're doing a self-driving car, nobody knows we can just do A, B, and C, get it working. It takes many, many iterations, collecting many, many more data. So it's important for you to start doing it today and show the interest. Like if you show interest, I look at your resume, I, I can, not care so much about GPA, I need to give you an interview. Thank you. To add on to that just a little bit, uh, I also echo the idea that project work is really important, but along with project work, what I think is really important is to be able to tell a story about the times that you tried a project and it completely failed. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, no one in here is going to do a perfect job, especially if you're working on some emerging technologies. Uh, everything that you do isn't going to come out swimmingly. But if you can tell a compelling story about what you tried, 
why you tried it, and then after it failed, what you learned from that failure. That's something that really shows a curiosity to me as uh, an interviewer, and something that will really help you stand out. Thank you. This side, how much you guys want to touch that? How many here are uh, software engineers? Class yourself as a software. <coughs> a data scientist? Two or three, yeah, four. So, I think for, just from pra a practical side of things, you know, there's so many different parts of the machine learning pipeline that involves so much engineering. And I think the focus could a lot of the times be on uh, the data scientist that writes models in Jupyter Notebook, right? But somebody needs to go and implement those models. And it's generally not the data scientist that does that. And so my, re my encouragement or recommendation would be figure out, do a couple of projects, you know, get some experience, but figure out what part of that you really like. You know, the data engineer in many organizations that have big data is more valuable than your data scientist because a company like Netflix, uh, their data engineers are, are far more known than their data scientists. You know, so figure out what side you like. If you love statistics and you really enjoy training the, the models and you know, tuning the hyperparameters, if you understand error analysis, all those things, you might be more kind of aligned with that. But if you're more of a kind of just engineer, you like to deal with really complex like data ingestion issues and you love that side, I mean, there's just so much need across the board. And you know, my current encouragement is you don't, you're not expected to do everything, right, from beginning to end. And as the kind of pipelines mature, it's going to be like any other CS field where you're going to have a really specific expertise in, you know, kind of the data side or the data collection or the data aggregation, whatever that is. So that's that's my, my two cents. Good. Awesome. Anybody else before I move? Okay. So this is kind of a fun question. Uh, so Elon Musk <laughs> seems to be really worried about AI. Uh, <laughs> if you've seen any of his talks. So, and, and particularly as it pertains to the future, and again, I'm just I'm looking for the panelists to give, what's your take on that? Like, should we be afraid of AI, or is there, is there a real concern? I mean, we do have to look at AI ethics, because that is important, so I will give credence to Elon and say, come on, guys, we have to look at AI ethics. We saw what happened at Google, we saw, what, come on, we need to give some credence to that, uh, to Amazon and others, right? But, um, what's your guys' take on that? Should we be afraid of AI? Is there something that's to be scared for? Who wants to take that? So no, no one. We shouldn't be afraid at all. <laughs> so, all right, so yeah, uh, so you go ahead. You got something? Right. Something big with AI is it's inevitable. So in my mind, if you want to get philosophical with it, there's no need to be afraid of what's coming because it'll be coming nonetheless. Uh, I think a more important question might be how can we make sure we're using AI in a way that it augments human capabilities? So instead of worrying about, you know, a Skynet scenario. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll be back. Exactly. Uh, look for opportunities where AI can help you understand a little bit more about the world around you and hopefully encourage the businesses that you interact with to trend in that direction with AI. It's good. Final set? Great. So uh, actually, I'm uh, not that uh, much uh, concerned about, you know, uh, that uh, futuristic, uh, you know, uh, nightmare. Uh, for us, I think we like uh, lift uh, uh, humanity with uh, cognitive uh, platforms we are uh, building. Like for uh, for one product, we uh, uh, built such a uh, platform to teach kids uh, uh, English, uh, mathematics, and uh, some Chinese, let's say, uh, to uh, make a human great. Uh, and then uh, next step uh, is something we need to worry about later. Uh, I think that's uh, so far, like uh, for me as an engineer, I, what what I can see, uh, not that long actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it, got but uh, it. I think uh, those things. I think uh, uh, governments, a uh, government need to uh, I think uh, spend more uh, time and energy to actually look at like what AI can do or cannot do, like in maybe ten years, uh, twenty years, and then they need to uh, uh, define some rules. We with uh, those uh, industry and with those uh, you know engineering uh, to uh, make more uh, uh, regulations that it's more suitable for AI. Let, let's say like what type of uh, 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 design we can uh, do to our you know uh, AI agent. Mm -hmm. So all, all those rules, if we define that well, I think uh, uh, there's not too much uh, things to worry. That's good. That's good. Yeah, we all have to consider our own biases. <coughs> in the information and the data that we're utilizing, right? Um, 
obviously when we're not looking at our own bias and we inform, we allow our bias to be informed into the data, you, you, the output's not going to work, right? We, and we've seen that in the news with certain big, large organizations uh, in, in that regard. So here's a personal question for, for the panel. Um, why, did you, why did you get into a, a job, a career within the emerging technology stack, personally? And I, I like to hear from all of you, because all of you have a different perspective. You all come from different companies. So if you all can answer that question, uh, and we'll just start and we'll go left to right. Why did you jump into a career in the AI or emerging technology stack? Sure. So instead of focusing specifically on AI, I'll talk about automation in the broader context. Sure. The hardest job I ever had was my freshman year of college. I was doing uh, data entry and e-filing for a doctor's office. And it was by far the most tedious job I've ever done. <laughs> I narrowed it down to figure out that every four seconds I was making a cent. And in my head, that was the counter that kept me going. Uh, so, you know, after that summer of making $10 an hour, which was not nearly enough for uh, what that job was, uh, I realized that, you know, there's folks out there that have to do that sort of work day in, day out, and that'll be their life for the next 40 years. And so ever since then, as I learned more about RPA, robotic process automation, I realized that there really is that opportunity to take the robot out of the human and ideally free up those people's time so that they're able to focus their mental efforts, their time, any of that on things that are more meaningful. Thank you. David? I would have to say uh, curiosity. I mean, I'm a, I'm a trained financial engineer, so I'm very, already very familiar with a lot of statistics and math and are using what you call the traditional models to predict stock return. It's more like you question yourself, is there more you can do? It doesn't mean it's gonna, it's gonna lead to a good result. You don't know that. But then, as a, I think a part of a career, what you wanna, you wanna continue to evolve. You wanna continue evolving with what's out there. So for me, it become pretty clear I wanted to start at least test out machine learning, test out natural language processing to deal with textual data and let's see what I can do with it. Because if you think about, I mean, I, think, I assume all of you are in your early 20s, I think if you look at your career path, there are always gonna be new technology out there. You don't wanna be the, and the, I'm, I don't think we all have to be afraid of AI, but I think at a personal level, if you do think your job will be replaced, because it is a task that can be done better by a machine, but then you need to evolve as well. You want to be, I think you're better off be the, per, be the person that create that model, or create that machine, than be replaced. So <laughs> yeah. I'm trying, trying to say continuous education is very, very important in this field. And that will always be a reason to push you to learn new things and then not be left behind. That's good. Kelsey? Yeah, so I'm actually so glad you asked the question because my story is a little unique. Um, technology just a career in technology kind of just fell in my lap. And I, um, because of a group project I had actually done in college, um, one of my uh, classmates was interning at Silence and was moving into a different role and recommended this company. I had never heard of Silence. I would have described myself previously as technology resistant. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, and coming on board to Silence and really learning about the mission and how technology can really um, solve a problem and help improve people's lives, um, it changed everything for me. And I know I'm on a, I'm on the HR side and I I don't do I'm not in the weeds doing all the technic technical stuff and I'm not doing the developing part, but I get to enable those people and really watch the magic happen from a different perspec uh, perspective. And, um, and now I can't imagine uh, being in any, uh, working for a company that's not in technology just because there's so much to learn. I've learned so much. I'm surrounded by the most brilliant people who just want to share their knowledge and who are all mission focused and working towards something together. And I real in the technology space, because they're always solving that problem, there's a huge community about it. And I, I love that aspect too. And um, just really that feeling of we're working together and we're making something happen. And um, I'm also a lifelong learner, and or that's how I would describe myself. And in the technology space, there's always something new to learn. Um, and it just always seems cutting edge at all times, and I love that. Awesome. Thank you. Isaac? 
Yeah, so for me it was pretty accidental as well. I think uh, I come from a software engineering background. So when I was doing my master's, I obviously, and, and in the United Kingdom, it's a little bit more like PhDs where you have to do a fairly extensive thesis. And I was trying to come up with some ideas on what I could do. I and mean, cybersecurity was my background. And so I kind of just had a look at a few things. And DARPA um, had this uh, tender out for trying to create a way to detect users without passwords, so kind of like behavioral biometrics. And so that, and that's where I sort of fell into the whole, uh, at the time I didn't even know it was semi-supervised learning. I didn't even know what clustering was. I, didn't, I had no idea what, you know, statistics was. And, uh, and essentially the thesis was around using your mobile phone. Within like five touches, you could generate a unique ID on the person and every other touch will be an anomaly detecting if it's whether it's you or not. And so for me, that kind of just, I loved that. I absolutely loved coming up with like a model and I had no idea. And so, you know, <laughs> so I am saying that I encourage you that even if you're not a maths or a statistics background, like, you know, I just, I think those skills you can learn. And for me, it was just, I, I think if you're in the software field, you're a compulsive problem solver, you know? So if you're passionate about problems and solving them, the, the, the hard skills you can learn, you know, the statistics you can learn. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. And, you know, obviously ever since, uh, you know, been, been into different fields of AI. Got it. Good. Great. Uh, I think uh, 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 passion uh, for technology is uh, the biggest reason. Uh, and in uh, 2004, when I was third year uh, a bachelor uh, student uh, uh, majoring in a civil engineer, and I actually <laughs> decided to switch to AI uh, in uh, that year. Uh, but uh, at that time, I think AI is in cold winter, so it, it's not like it, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's not like a, uh, it's hot is a topic uh, now. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, passion is the first uh, big reason, and there are a lot of uh, advantages that come uh, uh, along with this. Uh, one is, uh, uh, of course, right now it's like a salary is uh, very high and growing fast, and secondly, it's like you can meet a lot of people and discuss with them. Uh, a lot of resources you can use. Uh, third is, uh, this is, uh, it never get uh, boring. And it is an uh, uh, ever-changing uh, uh, industry in almost every aspect. So uh, I don't feel, you know, it is not boring. So it's uh, exciting all the time. So uh, it, uh, this is something uh, uh, I think uh, it, uh, encouraged me to uh, work on this uh, area. Awesome, thank you. Uh, one more general question for all of you in the, in the, on the panel here, and uh, pretty simple. Who do you follow on social media? And, and again, if you have any, anyone uh, that's in AI, that'd be preferential. But again, if there's the Gary Vaynerchuks and whatever, that, that, that too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, who do you follow on social media? What thought leaders, blogs, articles, content do you consume? Uh, and how, how do you stay current and fresh? Uh, David, you mentioned kind of you know, always learning. I've, I've kind of heard that popcorn a few times. So just we'll go left to right again. We'll start with ammo, like who you're following, who you're watching, books you're reading. Again, we just want to give some of the, the students here kind of referential to where to go. So that's probably the worst question to ask me because I'm not on social media. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so no one. Okay. Yeah, effectively no one. Are there any books or blogs or anything that, uh, that you know, maybe there's a nugget that a book someone hasn't read or... I think uh, for me personally, a big part of my approach towards you know approaching the business world is I try to distance myself from it in my personal life. So if you guys were following anyone on social media, I would encourage it to be you know a poet, an artist, a creator that inspires you versus just looking for technologists that are telling you what's been done and what they can do. Look for people that inspire you to do what you can do. It's a highly fresh perspective. I value that. Thanks. I don't have a social media. <laughs> <laughs> so you're on your own, students, is what we're saying. You're on your own, figure out. Uh, but I, I do think there's still um, pioneers in, in this field that you can follow. And for me, it's mainly the kind of the people who I learned from. Uh, I, I didn't really take any AI classes in school because they were not offered in school at that time. But I, I started taking some online classes. I mostly learned from... Um, the CS department at Stanford, so uh, Andrew, Andrew, Inge, yeah. Andrew Inge, Christopher Manning, yeah. uh, Fei-Fei Li. So uh, kind of like start following their research and their um, kind of also, of course, take their classes. So just find, just really trying to find the, just go out your way, find the resources, and then there's, 
in, personally, I like to find uh, the pioneers and uh, see their research. Mm. Yeah, it's good. But I don't really have a Twitter, a LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn, I barely go there, but <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Kelsey, you know? That's awesome. Well, um, for my job, I, I have to have uh, social media, <laughs> so I do follow um, some people, and and I our blog. So, our, like I mentioned before, at BlackBerry Silence, we're, I'm so fortunate because I'm surrounded by all these amazing, um, brilliant people who just want to share knowledge. So I do follow a ton of our own employees because they're always posting thought leadership. Some of my favorites are Scott Schaferman. He's our um, senior director of professional services. And he just has the most amazing ability to explain really technical things in a way that even if you're not technical, it just clicks for you. Um, I also I follow our CEO, our founders, um, so Stuart McClure and Ryan Perma, and then I follow our data side. I, I try to follow as many people on our team as possible, and then we also have a um, we actually have a thought leadership blog um, called Threat Vector, and um, our team members are actually um, publishing their research or um, uh, or their thoughts on on some emerging emerging trends in the industry. And so um, I also try to stay up to date as possible. We, we have like two to three blogs a day that come out. So there's always brand new information um, that's going on. And then um, I also, too, I, I like to also keep an eye out what our competitors are doing, too, and, and kind of learning what's the differences between what we're doing versus what they're doing and, and learning a lot from that perspective as well. So, um, so similar companies that you're interested in, I rec always recommend following them on LinkedIn and just kind of comparing and seeing what they're also doing. Awesome, thank you. I'll take a stab at this for myself. I'd also add Jeffrey Hinton or anyone up in Canada, because uh, there's a, if you, if, for those of us that know that there's a lot of AI research and you know er, Jeffrey went to Google very very early on, right? So if you look at guys like Andrew Ng, Stanford, or Jeffrey Hinton, some of the pioneers, uh, been in this space for 20 years, right? And now we're starting to see it bubble up. Right. Um, I also follow Isaac Bozeman, who uh, machineislearning.com. There's a plug for you. <laughs> uh, you know, guys, there, there's a lot of people. I mean, I, I recommend uh, Siraj Raval, maybe a school of AI uh, as well. Um, and that would be great to see a school of AI just in this greater OC area. That would be really cool. Uh, we can all hear Siraj come here and rap. If you don't know Siraj, we'll all check him out. He raps on YouTube, and he's excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would recommend him as well. So those are a couple names that I throw in the hat for myself personally. And we'll move to Isaac. Well, I am on social media. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have a biased opinion. But um, I think if you're, again, if you're sort of more of an engineer, uh, Medium has really great publications. Uh, there's one I read quite a lot called Towards Data Science. It's a really great publication. It's got hundreds and hundreds of examples of how to tackle a specific problem, and it's all the way from kind of beginner to like real PhD level research, and it's pretty practical. I think that's really great. And, and I, I'd say, you know, I'd add to that, there's a researcher in New York, Jan LeCun, he's quite, he works for Facebook, uh, he's Facebook's research chief. He's great. There's loads of great researchers. So it depends what you want. If you want something a little bit more academic, George Hinton's great, Andrew N's great, Jan LeCun's great. If you want something a little bit more practical, uh, definitely Medium's got a really great, you know, towards that. So again, I'm, I, I write for the publication, so I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, you know, there's, there's some good articles there. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Lastly, uh, I will follow you. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, 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 I don't uh, follow uh, anyone else. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone follow Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what we're no. yeah, uh, I usually uh, keep myself updated uh, by reading all those uh, research and uh, engineering work uh, published in most uh, AI uh, uh, conference, such as uh, Chip AI, mm -hmm. uh, each kind, uh, ACL. Uh, uh, those uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, that's where I spend most of my time because I need to keep uh, uh, all the things update and uh, day to day like uh, uh, next uh, next day tomorrow like uh, when uh, colleagues uh, come to me like uh, uh, saying that we uh, this uh, this paper we can try then I need to actually refresh myself and uh, look into it so uh, but uh, sometimes I need to come up with more concrete idea that can be used in particular uh, in the product line. So uh, 
uh, I, I have uh, you know motivation to read those uh, things. So uh, social media, I think uh, it's uh, if you want a first hand uh, you know material, go to those you know uh, uh, research uh, papers and uh, uh, proceedings. But if you want some something that is easier for you to digest, I think uh, social media is, uh, is the first uh, first door you need to uh, open. Got it. So yeah, like across the across the board from no one to research paper. I mean, it's funny how we started with no one, no one, kind of more research, right? So we've got the gamut here, and I threw in a couple sprinkles for you there. Hey guys, well that's uh, we're, we're coming up on two o'clock. I mean, just to honor everyone's time, we want to hi. Oh, no problem. So we want to jump into some Q and A from you guys, uh, and now's the time. If you have any specific questions, where you'd like to ask our panelists, we'll go ahead and open it up to the floor. I think we have a microphone that's being passed around, so we'll start back there. Yeah, sure. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. The one second. That's David. The, David, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, if I, I know someone who has an interest in the markets and who has an interest in computer science, um, is there a way to combine both in terms of looking for a career? Of course. Uh, what would be your suggestions? I mean, you can just talk. You can just have that person talk to me. Oh, okay. uh, I, I think in general. Um, where would they find you? Not on social media or <laughs> 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 business uh, cards. Business, business cards. <laughs> okay. People don't use business cards anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think in general, um, th this is my take. It, it doesn't represent uh, how my firm thinks or anybody else thinks. Is that in finance field, where finance, I, I think is a social science as well. I mean, it's not a hard science. We're borrowing techniques from different fields. But on some of the newer technique or dealing with the newer type of data, like textual data, we're using old techniques. So if you do have an interest in computer science and finance, you can bring some of the new techniques in there. You might be able to find something interesting. And I, I think that's actually a great combination to go into finance today compared to maybe 10 years ago. There's a lot of financial firms that prefer you to have a CS background. Because they're, they are using, truly using just technology to find uh, patterns in the market. Uh -huh. Thank you. Awesome, Come thank you. Your card afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question from students? Any questions here? Hey David, uh, just want to continue the question. Uh, just curious, uh, is, are you uh, for the marketing uh, engineering? Is it more like a, uh, the model you're working on is more like human behavior model, or is it like just high frequency trading? We're not I'm high. Just we're, we're not high frequency trading. Oh, all right. So uh, you might be able to apply machine learning for high frequency, but if you're thinking about longer investment, there are too many. Uh, the, the too many the too many things can affect where the stock go up or down. So what I'm trying to explore is can I model my own behavior? Uh, so in which I have the inputs, it could be the same input I use to predict stock return. I also have the output, which is a label. Did I buy or sell that stock? So what did I look look at? I'm sure I look at some uh, quant like quantitative model output, but maybe because I think. Sometimes, you know, as a human, you can be a little uh, subjective. I look at uh, another 20 different things. In my mind, I might think 20, they are all important, but I think my action speaks louder. So I can train a model to see what, what do I really look at. That sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sounds like you need a lot more data. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Got a question from Pat? back here, and then we'll go to you after that. Okay, we'll go there first. <laughs> Do this first. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, could I ask a few questions? Uh, sure. Thank you. And my first question is, uh, is there any possibility for a small company that focused on AI uh, to grow into a bigger company? Because in my, in my personal view, uh, in what I saw, uh, I didn't see a lot of small AI companies grow into a very big company because you know, like uh, 
like a small yeah, complete building maps for the automatical uh, automatical driving or some some building are other tools for other companies. They don't have a like have a many opportunities to grow into a big company. So that is a concern for me because uh, if I want to uh, want to go to a small AI company and do grow with the com grow with this company, but unfortunately the company can grow in, into a very big or bigger or very big company. So yeah, I think that's uh, what I concern. So. I let me, let me just kind of and, and, um, take a stab at this. What I hear you saying is, um, you know, a small company, is what's the possibility or potentiality of that company having an uptick and a swing and becoming a bigger company as a result of utilizing AI? Is that, is that fair? Uh, yeah, because uh, a lot of companies that focus a lot of, of their energy in AI, so they don't like to have a chance to grow into a very big company. Yeah, and, I, and let me take a first stab at that, guys, and I'll pass it to the panel. So, you know, the big four, right, the, the big four da data aggregators, Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, they hire a lot of the smartest people in the world because they have the biggest budgets, right? They make seven-figure offers ad nauseum, yeah. right? Imagine that, seven figures, here you go, right? <laughs> so my, my, my point is, to answer your question, I'll give it to the panel, you, you know, it depends on you. It depends on, I think, what you, your AI company, whatever, sm a smaller company, is bringing to the market to disrupt, right? And there's a lot of verticals that these bigger companies just cannot tackle based on bandwidth, right? They're tackling the big overall umbrella of data and how, how some of these, um, you know, um, problems are being solved kind of on bigger levels. But, man, there's so many smaller verticals that you can make a killing in if you wanted to. And, and grow that way. So that's my take. Anybody else have a different take on, on that first question? I'd love to jump in on that. And so, you know, Silence, the, so to give you some background about Silence, is we actually started as a really small AI company, and we came and we disrupted the antivirus software market, right? Yeah. Utilizing AI. And so, and that happened in six short years. We're, we're about to have our seventh birthday, right? And we went from literally like a, a renovated house to, uh, we, we ended up moving like seven times and now we're in the tallest building in Irvine. So we really we really have like that, almost like that Microsoft, you That's know. not quite rags to riches though. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, I'm with you. Right, and so the, so I think, I mean I've gotten to be a part of a company where it's happened, where you started, where literally our founders are in this renovated home and now, We've got we've built it up, and what's so cool is now if you've heard me say BlackBerry Silence or Silence, is now we even been acqui recently acquired by BlackBerry, who's even hu more huge. So, um, you know that we there's definitely huge potential. I would say, and I love being in the startup experience. Yeah, it's just um, you really are you get to impact everything. Every. You know, whether you're a data science or an engineer, um, or you're on the HR team, you're you have an impact because you're so small, and then you get to watch that scale and grow and be like, "Wow, I was here since the beginning," and that's an incredible feeling. Awesome, thanks for that, Adisha. We'll, we'll get to your second question in a second. Just make sure anybody want to tackle that. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's something I uh, 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 said in my mind for a long time. Uh, I think in 2017. Uh, when I uh, got my green card, uh, I actually took my job in big company, and I uh, start a new position in this uh, small company, which uh, I was the number one employee uh, in the uh, company. And right now it grows uh, to 60 uh, uh, people in uh, Los Angeles and 160 people in uh, Guangzhou, uh, China. So we only focusing on developing a cognitive AI platform that just solve uh, uh, problems in education, uh, which is a, a very uh, small vertical uh, uh, area, just help uh, students uh, just uh, talk to uh, uh, develop a uh, system that can uh, talk to kids, uh, learn, uh, uh, help kids learn things and uh, solve their homework problem. So that's just one uh, vertical, uh, you know, uh, market, uh, which uh, have a lot of uh, uh, chance 
for our small company to grow up. So uh, just, just give you a one uh, example. Although it's not, maybe uh, we will fail next year, but yeah. <laughs> right now, this <laughs> will fail forward, right? Fail forward. Yeah. That's, right. That's great. Yeah. Um, awesome, I'll throw one more in there for you, and then we'll get to your second question. Um, so a friend of mine started a company out in Silicon Slopes, which is in Utah, and uh, he, he's one of the folks that got a seven-figure offer from the Big Four, turned it down for, to start his own company. Well, <coughs> anybody heard of GANs, G-A-N? By show of hands, who's heard of GANs, G-A-Ns? Okay, it's about half of us, all right? Generative Adversarial Networks, right? Okay, so what he did, and, and his company, um, <laughs> Who's seen The Bachelor, Bachelorette? Show of hands. You, or you know what I'm talking about. At least. Okay. I know you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So for the last three years, his company has used GANs, right, Critter, uh, critic actor networks, right, general actor, to predict the winners of the last three seasons of The Bachelor and Bachelorette. So much so, right, using GANs, right, uh, to, to generate faces and things like that. Okay. So much so that the president of ABC called him and said, how are you doing this? So to your answer to your question, you can be a small company that a megalithic company reaches out to you because you're expert in AI and says, how are you doing this? That's, that's pretty compelling, right? So uh, I'm saying that to say, if you have a, a thought or an idea or a path towards something you're looking to do in AI, man, put your heart and soul behind it. Fail fast, fail forward, right? That's how I approach that answer. Second question. Yes, thank you so much for on first, and uh, my second question is, because uh, uh, for my internship, I applied for several like machine learning engineer internship or uh, applied scientist internship. Uh, but as I can see, uh, I think my interviews went uh, like from my side very well. But at the end, I just received a rejection uh, email because I think my, maybe there are two reasons. Uh, I want you to uh, see if this. Uh, my guess is right. Uh, the first reason I think is that there are less positions opening for this kind of job uh, other than the software engineer internship. And the second reason I think uh, maybe the company they prefer um, like PhD to do this kind of job is, is my guess that gets me right or is there are any other uh, reasons for this? Anybody want to take, I, I can take the first one on that if anybody else wants to. My, you know, my thought is it's, it's, it's hard to tell, right? I think the panelists would have to know a little bit more about you or what type of job, what type of career, what type of thing that you're looking at. And that might be a question you can ask offline and give a little bit more information to one of the panelists. And maybe they can give, give an answer um, when we wrap up here in a second. Um, you know, so I think that's part, part of the answer. And you never know what specifically the, the company is, is looking for specifically unless they tell you specifically and aren't holding their cards. Right, because some companies don't want to put it out there what they're looking for unless you're it, right? Yeah. And so the more transparent companies uh, might share a little bit more specifically what they're looking for, and then you can weight yourself ba based on did you have that or did you not have that, right? So that's how I take that answer to that. Anybody else want to jump into that, or we can offline that? Okay. I'd love to jump Please. in on that just from a recruiting standpoint. So one, if you um, one if you get an email, a rejection email, or or a letter. Um, it, it's always great to follow up with your recruiter to ask what was the interview feedback. So that you can um, you can take that and you know maybe it was um, if there was some kind of problem solving challenge or something, and then you just have that have that knowledge and you can go work on those skill sets. Or um, and sometimes honestly, it's just the luck of the draw. Someone was just more qualified. So please don't get discouraged. The other thing is um, you you were oh, you were spot on thinking that. Um, we may need someone that's uh, more qualified from like a PhD standpoint. So this is one of the challenges that we face because it's an emergency, uh, emerging field. We need people. We're at a we're at a weird spot right now where we need people who are already experts that can come in and just do the job um, from day one. So a lot of times it can be challenging for students because. Um, we, j we need those experienced people to get things going and then build that up so we can have time to mentor a student. And we're just on the precipice of that now. So um, I know I can only speak for BlackBerry Silence, but we're starting to um, ask, um, ask our data science team uh, for, or, or sorry, excuse me, our data science leaders are starting to ask for master's student level 
um, interns, so that way we can start building that future pipeline and um, and include you in, in the process. But we that's only happened in like this last year, so I think it's coming soon <laughs> for you. There was the last year that, uh, so uh, what I understand from you is that I should like wait wait for those uh, companies to grow into a bigger company and they can hire <laughs> <laughs> master students. I don't know. Well, I, 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 no. <laughs> And then just know that, so I, I guess where I was going with that is just, just know it's not always you and to keep trying and yes, as, as, a, as the company continues to develop and grow um, and, and we're so excited about your generation because there, there's such a scarcity of talent out there right now um, and uh, we're just so excited that this new generation of students are interested in this area and want to take on this type of work and, and can help further us. Um, in our mission. It's good. Thank you. Anybody else? I, 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 I saw you. On that. Okay. Uh, Please share um, I think I think. Uh, I, see you back there. I, I think Kelsey had a good point. Is because machine learning is very new, especially a lot of companies trying to adopt machine learning. There's not a pipeline yet, which means they they want to hire someone to help their business. So they're probably less likely to to just take a take someone without experience, without a PhD, right now just because they might not have someone to train you, or they maybe only have a single data scientist. So, so what you need to show is you, you demonstrate you have been doing, even though you only have, let's say, undergrad, graduate, or even PhD, doesn't matter, you want to demonstrate you have done this through your own project. I, I think that's important. Uh, unless you go into, let's say, the big four, many, many companies, including mine, trying to hire, let's say, a machine learning engineer, we don't expect so much training. We expect you to apply some of you know right away. And I just want to add a little bit to the first question. I think it's very important. It's actually easier to go into startup today than ever before, especially for AI. I think a big part we didn't talk about is the money part. There's a huge amount of money out there from VC. They don't care about that. <laughs> just kidding. So, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. so if you want to go to startup, or do your own startup, I write t today, it's easier to do it than a decade ago. Especially you have, you're doing an AI-based startup with a niche market. Because you have to think about everything. Infrastructure is easier with the AWS. Uh, everything else from a finance, HR, every other business side of business has become easier with the new software today. Right. You only have to focus on poor product, and as long as you can show progress, you can go to the next round of funding, next round of funding, and hopefully you do it well and make it big. Yeah, it's good. very inspiring. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and will you want to hit that too? Uh, sure. Uh, so the last thing on the internship piece is, especially I've worked with a lot of interns at UI Path, and as a hiring manager, especially when I work with interns, the number one thing I look for is curiosity and attitude. So uh, what that means is you may be hired for a specific role or a specific type of internship, but if you're generally curious and interested in what the business as a whole does, you have the opportunity to pivot and do whatever else it is that you may want to do. So with that, you can look for companies that are doing things that are inspiring for you or companies whose missions you believe in and just get your foot in the door. Once you're in there with the internship, you can start speaking to people, look for opportunities to get involved with ML and AI, and even if that's not your official title, that could be experience that you're building. Awesome, thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions, and then we'll see, Jason, I see you. Um, we want to give you guys a little bit of time, officially to end around 2.30. We want to give you guys a little time to spend time with the panelists, so you can ask your questions offline. Just keep that in mind. The panelists will be here until at least 2.30. Um, some might stay, some might not. So let me just hit a few questions. I saw you, Mammoth, back. Let's do your question, and then we, we just have a few more. Yes. Um, someone experienced in the – can everyone hear me? Oh, we can hear you fine. You. Okay. Someone ex very experienced in the business world but not experienced in CS told me recently your best chance of getting a great job is straight out of college. Don't wait. On the other hand, I found in general tech people are a little more um, flexible in their attitudes than a lot of other business people. Um, if the person is doing gigs and exploring and doing projects and, and figuring out exactly what specialty they, they really are passionate about, are they at a disadvantage than applying for their real job like a year or two later? What type of that? 
Absolutely not. But where ultimately uh, in the tech field, at least in my experience, it's always been based on what people are, are able to learn and are able to do. So it doesn't really matter you know, what your credentials are. No one's going to look at a gap in your resume and ask you what you were doing. That's not a major criteria for hiring as far as I've experienced. I think the landscape's changing, right? And so like if you had a startup, to David's point and to what Anne was saying, if, you had, if there was a startup, like there's a gap in terms of I was a big enterprise, big enterprise gap, and that gap was you tried something, you were went out in the market yourself, that as long as you can prove and demonstrate, right, there's something there, I think it still aligns, right? It, ha it has to be demonstrative, but sure, I think there's something aligns. Anybody else want to tackle that? Okay, let's go to the next question. Thank you for that. Oh, sorry, Jason, go ahead. One real quick question for the students as a general question. Um, because AI and ML is, the landscape is changing so fast and so much, if you were to put yourselves in the student's position, like starting out fresh with a career, or just finishing your master's degree, what industry would you go towards? Would it be healthcare? Would it be energy? Would it be retail? Agriculture is big for AI expansion. What would it be if you were to be in their shoes and just starting out? Am, am I allowed to say cannabis on campus? <laughs> I would do cannabis. I personally, I'm sorry, you asked me, I'm going to answer the question. Do you have to throw some panelists? It, it, this is it's a non biased answer, so yeah. Okay, so to me, I would say cannabis and AI. There's so much. Don't stop there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I can maybe speak to that. It's a really good question. I think, I, I don't know if I would think about it you know, in the sense of it's an AI, how does AI, you know, relate to that field? But rather in terms of, you know, what do you find the most exciting work? You know, in terms of, if you love computer vision, there are certain industries that lean towards that. If you love research, you know, like if we talk about the finance field, if you're passionate about finance, uh, you know, I think AI is essentially proliferating all industries, right? There's a study by Fortune magazine that says 62% of jobs are going to be replaced. What we understand is jobs today in the next 10 years. You know, so it's 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 not only changing the landscape of businesses, but it's it's changing the way we work. And so, uh, you know, for me, I think I would sort of really just be looking at an industry that I find really interesting, because you know, contrary to a lot of other research fields like mathematics, for example, if you want to publish a paper in mathematics, it takes 20 plus years to get published, right? Where an AI is pretty, it's pretty quick because it's such an impactful field, and and so if if you really want to get into it, you're going to find there's areas where you can make a big difference, and so if that's your motivation. That's how I, that's how I'm motivated. I, I want to make a difference. I think AI is going to really change people's lives, and so I don't, I'm not sure if I'm as tied to it in industry. So I don't think it really answers the question directly, but I guess I just think about it a little bit different. I don't think it's as important to me as what vertical I get involved in, as long as I'm doing what I love, what I enjoy. You know. I think that is an excellent question, yeah. right? Do what you love, do what you enjoy, and find a patch that fits that in, mm -hmm. in the technologies you want to serve. Anybody else want to take that? Yeah, I can. I okay. can. So, um, of course, I'm going to say security. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so, so uh, along with security, though, um, I think too what we're realizing is security and healthcare play a lot hand in hand. So that industry as well, um, there's so many opportunities for an AI solution to really come into play. Um, so that's from my industry research, that's kind of where things are headed. And that industry needs a lot of help. Yeah. Because they're way yeah. they're behind the times on yes. security yeah. and yeah. the AI and yes. all that. Got it, got it. Well guys with that, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call our time officially and uh, allow you to spend a few last few minutes that we have with the panelists, uh, but if you guys can help me in just thanking the panelists for being here today.